Well, good morning, everyone. Already all awake for the keynote. So <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce you to Richie, the author of Polars. You will know more about Polars in a, in a second. In case you don't know as a spoiler, it's an extremely fast data frame library. It's been growing in popularity a lot. And he just announced a week or two ago that he also incorporated Polars Inc a company to basically keep developing polars. So yeah, like thanks a lot for making the time, in particular knowing that you release polars every week <laughs> with lots of new features. So <laughs> we really appreciate you making the time to come here. So welcome, Richie. Hi, all. Thanks for having me. I'm also honored to have the first uh, keynote in my life. Um, I have an hour. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, a bit about me. My name is Richie Vink. Um, as Mark introduced, I'm the author of Polars. Uh, I started Polars three years ago as a hobby project, and it has grown way beyond that, uh, far more than I ever imagined that that, that would have happened. Um, I have a background in machine learning and software development. Um, yeah, and as of two weeks ago, I'm officially also a co-founder of a company. Um, Today I'm going to talk a bit about what, what Polars is, very short, and what Polars isn't, and then we're going to talk a bit about the promise of Polars and what we do under the hood to make this promise happen. Um, Polars, um, the identity of Polars, I always uh, describe it as a query engine with a data frame front end. Um, it's a data frame that respects 50 years of, of research done in relational databases. Um, when I started this, I saw that all relational databases did all kinds of cool optimizations, um, cool data structures, cool stuff which I didn't find back in, the, in most data frame implementations of the time. Um, some things are lazy evaluation and query optimization. This can have a speed up from none to, to 10x or more, um, because sometimes you can prove that you don't have to do any work, and the best work is work you don't have to do. Um, we min minimize materializations. One strategy, is, for instance, is copy and write, which Pandas also introduced, uh, as we saw in the talk yesterday. Um, we do this by slice-aware operations. We do this by reusing buffers. Um, for instance, if you do a sort and then a head, um, you can translate that into a top K, for instance, and that would save a lot of... Um, or if you read a file and then take a head, if you, you can only read the top N rows. That would save a lot of materializations you, do, you didn't need. The data types are constructed to amortize memory access and allocation cost. We use uh, Apache Arrow as memory format, um, but we control very much how we construct the arrow buffers, um, and we really are um, vigilant on, on making sure that we do this in an effective manner. It's written in a low-level language. It's written in Rust, and this gives you full control over performance, over memory, over threading, and critical parts. And in my opinion, if you want to get maximum performance out of a, a software, um, out of some software, I think you should be really close to the memory. You should control memory to minimize cache, cache misses, et cetera. Uh, most, op most compute operations are memory bound, um, so you have to be aware of that. It's designed for effective parallelism. What it is, we will get back on this a bit later, and it's designed for out-of-core processing. Out-of-core processing is the official name when you uh, have an, an algorithm that can deal with data sets that don't fit into memory. Um, if something doesn't fit into memory, you have to spill to disk, and you have to do it in a smart way. Um, and just using swap isn't the smart way. If you use swap, then the OS determines what goes to memory, and uh, yeah, everything stalls. I think everybody knows that that's if something swaps, uh, it's bad. And it's got very tight integration with I/O. That means we, mo for most I/O readers, we directly read into the memory we need. So it's. It's a single copy or zero copy after we have read. Um, and we also push a lot of optimizations into our, our IO readers, into our CSV or, or Parquet readers, et cetera. 
Um, what Polars isn't, um, this, it's, it's very simple. I'd say it's not a tensor or a matrix library. Um, there are people used to using a data frame as a matrix, um, but I think there are some constraints and assumptions that make it an ill-designed fit, and I think if you want to use numerical compute only on 2D or ND data structures, you shouldn't use Polars. Um, I want to talk a bit about Polist API. I think that's where it all starts. Um, this is a comment I made in, a di in an issue, um, I think a year ago, when somebody told us that Polars wasn't Pythonic. And um, it irritated me a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's also sort of the point that Polish isn't Pythonic. I don't want you to use for loops over a series. That would be slow. Um, and I also argue that Python itself sometimes doesn't know what Pythonic is. If we look at, for instance, um, per, uh, method names on a Boolean versus method names on a string, what's the, what's the rule? When do we need to use underscores? When, when do we concat the names? Um, there are a lot of inconsistencies um, in naming, uh, for instance. So, yeah, I was forced to see, say what we wanted with the API. Um, and this is not in, an, in a topmost order, but this is just in a random order. Um, we want to be readable. Readability over saving keystrokes. I think code is read way more often than that it's, it's written. When you write something, you know what you're doing. You know all the context. When you read something, it's way harder to understand what kind of data structures we've got here. What, what type is this? What's, so you want something to read. And I want, to, I want something to be close to English. Um, and therefore, you also have to be explicit over implicit. I don't want the description of an operation should describe what you do, but not an inherent state. Um, um, should, should m modify the algorithm. Um, we aim for a single return type per expression. The API should nudge to fast code, or slow code should be tedious to write. And I think this is a, on a gun, you have a safety handle. It should be hard to misfire if you don't want it. And also, in our API, I think it should be hard to do something you don't want. It should be hard to um, sh show we should nudge you in the way that we want polars to be used. Um, yeah, it should be pure, um, no in-place operations, no side effects. Um, if we would have side effects, a lot of optimizations would not be possible. Um, and uh, you also get the strange thing that if you pass a data frame to a function, it's, it's passed by reference and it can be modified in that function, which is something you shouldn't want. I don't think, maybe some people want it, but I don't think you should. Um, and we want to minimize ambiguity. Yeah, and this came, the example in that issue was, we, was for example, we called it lower. Um, Python calls string lower for going to lowercase, and we want, we want an, an extra word there. We want to have two lowercase, because that gives room for has lowercase or remove lowercase. Does it make sense? Being a little bit more explicit removes the ambiguity, lower what, lower, lower, yeah. Um, and we, are, we have some constraints in our API, and we have those constraints. Um, the, the most important constraints is that we want you to use the Polis API idiomatically, and with that we mean our Polis expressions. So we don't want you to use NumPy or Numba or dot apply in your own lambdas. And this has a few reasons. One, the most important one is that we don't know what you're doing there. Um, you go into Python world and not into Polar's world, and, or in NumPy world, and we have to guess or infer what, what the intent was. Whereas if you use our expressions, we know you use this expression, and we can optimize it. We can say, hey, you do a string operation and then this, but maybe we can, we, we can replace this function with this function, and that's cheaper. Um, so we understand what your intent is, and um, we can decide how we get from A to B most effectively. Um, it also allows ev to do everything in our runtime. So it means we can run in parallel. It means we can do out-of-core processing. Um, yeah, and we give you a domain-specific language. Um, 
which you can reuse everywhere in our API, and that leads to knowledge extrapolation. Because everything that runs on the Polar's expression engine follows the same rules. And if you understand how something works in a select context, you understand how it works if you pass this expression to a join operation, or in an aggregation, or a... If you understand Python, you understand it everywhere. So if you understand the vocabulary, you understand it on multiple places. Um, yeah, so, so the most important building block in Polars are expressions. Those are first-class citizens. You can almost use them. I think almost everywhere in our API, we are able to accept expressions. And expressions are, um, um, are functions that take a state of a data frame, one or multiple series, and sometimes also a state of a group. And they can produce another output series. Um, but expressions are composable, so every expression can be passed to a new expression. And by the composability of this, you can do, yeah, it explodes. The, the amount of things you can do is, uh, yeah. I think this, this, this speaks for itself, that if you can compose operations and transformations and functions, you start to become turn complete in, in some sense. Um, and the expressions, we want to be sort of similar to NumPy in this case, not with regard to tensor labor, te being a tensor library, but being having transformations and functions and um, everything you need should be eventually be available in an expression if it belongs to uh, the scope of our data processing. And we are very serious about it. So here's an example. I think someone who, who has seen the lightning talks of Marco, um, yeah, it's his, um, his ID and uh, credits to, to him and uh, Alexander Beattie, who um, it was always pain point to see a user use a, a lambda and apply where something could be done with a Polar's expression. And here, for instance, they use um, a JSON.loads from Python to extract JSON out of a string where we have a, an expression for this operation. And if you this would be very slow because you convert uh, our string representation to a Python string, which doesn't need to do a heap allocation. Then you pass it to JSON.loads, which returns a Python string, which is another heap, or which returns a JSON object, a dictionary, with, which contains multiple Python objects, which are multiple heap allocations. And then we need to, inf need to parse that again back into a Polar data type. So that would be extremely expensive to do it that way. And if we can do it in, on our side, we can optimize it and, and do it in an efficient way. So as you see, we replace this function and we get it, we parse this, this string JSON into a list with structs. Um, here's an example of how Polars looks. This is an example of Mark. Um, I don't want to explain the API too much. I want to explain the, the promise of the API and what we aim to deliver. Um, so this is, it, it's, it's very functional, it's very declarative. Um, and I think you, you read it from top, to from, from top to bottom, and every time you um, yeah, describe what you want to do and what you want as a result. Um, so now I want to go a bit more into what we want to promise. If you use our API, the first promise we give you is that we give you parallelism. And we give you parallelism without ever thinking about it. Um, and we do this, uh, the core building blocks uh, for this is called work stealing. Um, and work stealing means that what we have, we have a thread pool. Um, and by default, the thread pool is equal to the number of cores on your machine. And every thread pool has got a queue. And on this queue, we can publish tasks. And the task is, can be anything. It's a function pointer which takes some input and produces an output. And most tasks, now, a task can be an expression, but it can also be some lower level construct of our, our own algorithms. Um, and the publishing task, as I said, are function pointers, which makes them very cheap. There's no serialization or um, deserialization needed, which for instance, if you do Python multiprocessing and you send an object, it needs to be serialized and deserialized. Um, in this case, it's a, a, a pointer uh, swap. 
Um, and because we have the thread pool always alive, um, there is no thread startup cost. A thread startup cost is not insignificant. The OS needs to prepare a thread, which uh, is a system call, which is expensive. Um, and um, when a queue, when a thread is done with, with, pro, with, uh, with its queue, and it's, it has emptied its queue, so for instance, in the second image, we see the third processor, the ter third core, has finished its queue, it can start stealing work from another thread. It can, um, in this case, it took some work from the second thread, um, and the queue was split, and now both cores, um, yeah, do their work. Um, there's a slight overhead on work stealing. Uh, the overhead is that we need to acquire a lock, a mutex, and need to get, get, that, um, get that task to the other thread. In Python world, this overhead is very minimal. Um, for, for Python, um, for Python, uh, for Python, uh, yeah, uh, customs. Um, but as we use it very, very much, we have to think about how large our tasks are. We, not, we don't want two small tasks because then we are locking a lot, right? There's a lot of communication. So we want, ideally, if we have a pile of, pile of work, we want to. If we have three cores, we want to split it in three equal tasks. And that's not, not always um, easy, but that's something we try to figure out for you. Um, another benefit of the thread pool and the work ceiling is that we don't have any contentions between threads. The OS doesn't have to kill it, stop a thread and go to another thread to give the other thread some room, some, some time to execute, because the thread pool is never bigger than the amount of threads on your machine. Um, it wouldn't make sense to make it bigger than that. Um, so here's an example of how we split threads in Polars. This is an example. Um, um, this is not the definitive guide how we do it, because, for instance, we have six or seven group by strategies in Polars, so this is one of them. Um, but here we create a data frame with uh, 10 million rows and 1 million groups. And then on the first select context, we compute the number of unique. And n unique can be done with a group by. Um, and the n unique has some parallelism over the groups. So per group, we count the, the length. Um, so you see this on top. The yellow one is the queue, and the blue, the blue boxes are the tasks that are executed on the queue. Um, and in this case, we would parallelize over the number of groups in n unique, but times two, we wouldn't. We would keep that as a single task, and we wouldn't parallelize that because um, it's already simply vectorized. It's already fast. We don't need the groups there. Um, um, yeah, th that's how we would uh, split the tasks in the select case. In the in the group by case, we would. Um, we would do the group by, which, is, which would create a parallelism over every group, in this case, one million groups. But then we wouldn't split the n unique again into a, into a separate task, because then you would have one million groups times the n unique parallelism task you create, and that would explode the number of tasks, um, and we, which would create a lot of locking and a lot of overhead for parallelism. So here we, here we wouldn't do that, and uh, I tried to visualize that with extending the blue bars to the end unique. Uh, I don't know if it's a good visualization. I tried to make it somehow clear. And again, the times two just ignores the group groups at all, because we don't need to know anything about the groups to do a times two, two multiplication. Um, you don't have to know this as a user, but what I want to say is we, we, by using Polar's expressions and combining them, you can make them way more complicated than this. We will try to do this parallelism very effectively. And we are very really good at saturating almost all, all the threads available into the thread pool. Um, um, another benefit is that the thread pool is not bound to one query. You can run different Polar's queries. You can put it into a work scheduler, 
it can, it can act as a work scheduler in Airflow, for instance. You can have several, several tasks executing at the same time, and Polars will do the work scheduling. The, 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 the work stealing will be done automatically for you, um, and there will, be, there will be no contention. You can also accept work on a server um, in HTTP requests, and um, the Polar thread pool will, or the work stealing algorithm in Polars will ensure that uh, yeah, the load is balanced. Um, yeah, and you can use Polars as a compute library and get very effective parallelism for free. And we see this happening more and more. There are a few uh, new libraries who, instead of going to for NumPy w w for compute, um, especially in time series, we I, I've seen this happen. They go for Polars and describe it in Polars expressions and get the, get the parallelism and get the optimizations. Um, and another way we get parallelism is in our, well, we have two engines, um, and both engines have different parallelism strategies. The default engine in Polars is, um, you, all, you implicitly use this in Polars. You don't have to say anything to be using the default engine because it's the default. Um, and how we work here is that the nodes are, so this can be a query, right? You read something from a source, another source, you, do, you do apply an operator, an operator can be something, can be anything that uh, uh, multiplies a column times two or extracts JSON from a column or uh, does something interesting, something element-wise. or um, It can also be a sort in Polos, by the way. Then you join it, another operator rate, and a result. And um, in this case, in the default engine, the parallelism, um, everything is pushed on the, on the thread pool, um, but the parallelism is done in the operators themselves. So the operators themselves are completely parallel aware. A group by knows how to do its parallelism most effectively. A join knows how to do its parallelism most effectively. A melt knows how to do its parallelism most effectively. Almost all operations in Polars are parallel and parallel aware, and they are aware how to do this effectively. Um, because not everything is embarrassingly parallel. Um, a group by, for instance, is not embarrassingly parallel. There needs to be some synchronization um, to determine the, the groups. Um, the default engine is completely in memory, and it has also ad hoc um, query planning, so just-in-time query planning, and that's possible because everything is in memory. We can uh, we materialize the whole data frame, and we can, because we have the data, we can make just-in-time decisions. Um, we also have another engine. This is the streaming engine, and this one focuses on out-of-core processing. Um, and the the parallelism strategy is different here. It's also completely parallel, but it's, uh, in some sense, more constrained, less flexible. Um, we built several pipelines. Um, and a pipeline is a source. Everything starts with a source. And a source can be a CSV file, a Parquet file, any file. But it can also be a sink that has turned into a salt source. Um, so a source pushes some data into an operator, an operator can be a melt and explode, something that takes a, takes a batch and generates a new batch. And um, most operators can only take a batch and generate a new batch, um, but not everything can be an operator. Um, has anybody got an idea what cannot be an operator? So an, an operation that cannot take a batch and produce a new batch without seeing all data. That's the question. Yes, a sort. A sort is a sink because a sort needs all data before it's able to produce a new, a new batch. So a sink needs to get all data before it can be changed. Can be once it done, it, it has it has all data. It can be transformed again into an oper, into a source or into an operator. Um, so if we have, for instance, in this pipeline, we have a query with two joins. We push everything from the source into the join on the left, left hand side, uh, then the other one again, and th then those join operators, they will have built an internal state, 
and then they can transform into a, uh, sorry, the join things have built an internal state, and then they can be transformed in a join operator, and they are able to push the other side of the join, the, the right-hand side through as an operator. Um, and how do we do parallelism here? Well, the sources, the operators, and the things, they all have internal threads. And the internal thread takes a batch and um, takes a batch and, and pushes it forward. Um, and the source um, can just produce batches. The operators don't have to be parallel aware. They don't have to know anything about the other threads. They can just take a batch, do their operation, and push a new batch. So we can just be embarrassingly parallel on, on every operator. The sinks have to be parallel aware. A uh, sort needs to do synchronization to, um, yeah, to, to, be, to, to, to deal with parallelism. So the parallel awareness is in the sink in the streaming engine. And they are also out of core. Uh, at the moment, we, can, we are out of core with sorts, with, with unique operations, with group by. Um, we're not yet with joins, but a join can take significantly less memory because we can stream the right-hand side. So we only need the left-hand side inner state as a hash table, and the rest can, can, be, jo can be streamed. Um, so even though your whole data set doesn't fit into memory, it's still very likely that we can do the sort out of partially out of core um, or streaming. Um, yeah, so, so this is the second promise. If you use the Polos API, we try to, you also get out of core operations. It's not completely finished yet. It's still uh, in development, um, but we're getting more and more out of core operations in the streaming engine. And um, the third promise we do is that we do optimization. And this takes responsibility from the programmer. And we, as query engine designers, know way better than users of a data frame library how which optimizations should be done at which point. So we also should try to do this and get this information out. Um, and I think we already got, we already have Python as, as a glue language, which works great because we have NumPy, uh, uh, PyTorch, um, all these libraries that um, give you C performance and um, v very fast factorized processing. Um, it gives you the performance, but it doesn't give you the optimizations you also get if you would write something in C or in C++ or in Rust. The compiler would also do all kinds of optimizations for you if it can prove that that it can do, can, can, a compiler doesn't run your code as you're, you've written it. Um, and I think a query engine also shouldn't. So we want to give you A, C, performance, but also B, the optimizations. If we can prove, we can do something better. Um, and that can have a very significant impact. So here is the, just a query where we uh, we read a parquet file, we filter uh, some data, we do a group by an aggregation. And first we run it without optimizations, which takes one second, and then we run it with optimizations, and it takes uh, 160 uh, microseconds. So you, you get this optimization for free. You didn't need to do anything special. You don't have to adapt your query. Uh, you don't have to say which columns you want from the parquet file. Uh, you don't have to pass a predicate to the read. Um, you get all these optimizations for free. Um, and I want to talk a bit about the optimizations we do. Um, so here is the optimized query plan for this query. Um, and as you see, we have a self-join here. Uh, query is query.join query. So we join the, the tree with itself, and then you get sort of a join on top and the sub, the sub, sub plans on both sides of the, the join. So you, if we would run this naively, we would run this two times. Um, so the first thing we do is, hey, we recognize this and we cache that. So um, you see the join takes from a cache. And the cache only is alive for one, one call. Um, and after that, we remove the in-memory state. 
Um, what you also see is the, this is a database um, or query and relational algebra uh, um, algebra uh, um, definition, symbols. The pi stands for the number of selected columns. It's called projection in relational algebra. Sigma stands for um, filters, predicates, um, which you apply at an operation. And we show them into the source. And as you can see, we have uh, pi 4 over 17. So what we have done here, we, we, we recognize that you only, only use four columns of the, of the whole Poké file, uh, where there are 17. So we only load four. And we apply this, the predicate at the scan level. So our Poké reader is aware of our predicates. And what we can do is we can take a look at the statistics in the Paquet file. And every row group, so the Paquet file consists of row groups which has got some statistics, um, like min aggregations, max aggregations. Um, um, and we can take a look if, if we can promise that we don't need to read this row group. And if so, we can skip loading this whole batch from, there, from this, which saves a lot of time. If not, we can still save a lot of materializations because we can apply the filter um, on the row group um, before we materialize into the, def into the definite state we want in Polars. Um, so in both cases, we are able to save a lot of, um, yeah, save a lot of um, a runtime costs, but also memory. And the second, the predicate optimization, you couldn't have done yourself um, unless the Poké reader, you have to modify your query and, and, and stuff. Um, yeah, that's, that's, this shows two, two optimizations we do. Those are heuristics, and those are very common. Um, but I, I'd argue those are almost never done in real life. Most people just write their queries and forget about pushing the filters down and pushing the columns down. Um, this is another optimization we do. Um, last talk, I had to say the PR was ready, and we, I promised to, that we would do it. Now we, we, we do it, so that's nice. Um, so if you look at the first query, we say, OK, we have a data frame, and we want to add two columns. And those, we multiply quantity with extended price, and then we compute the mean, and the other time we compute the sum. Um, but as you can see, we do some operation two times. And currently, before this operation, before this optimization, we, um, yeah, we would do the comp computation double, where it's fairly easy to prove that it's only done a single time. So currently, we keep an internal state, do the operation once, and then we use that, um, that operation. Um, this is a simple example, but this actually happens a lot. Um, especially once expressions get more common and you have if-else branches, for instance, we have if-else branches. And on those, especially in branches, it's very common to reuse different parts of sub-expressions. Um, well, this is easy for the programmer. You can just write your expression in a variable and don't think about, don't waste your time trying to set a temporary variable and, and, uh, and stuff. Well, actually, there are a lot of optimizations we do, and um, I cannot, I will not go into all of them because some are engine specific. But I will go into the the most important ones. Um, we have uh, single pass optimizations, which means before we run the query, we do a single pass and apply this optimization. Um, the first thing is check the schema. We want polars to fail very fast. If you have an ex an error, and if we have a schema, uh, if we can prove that the schema is inconsistent, we can, run, we can throw an error before we run the query and not 20, time, 20 minutes in the query when we hit the join node and we see that, that those two columns wouldn't fit. Um, projection pushdown, which I described just a few seconds ago, projection pushdown pushes the selection of columns as low as possible and ideally to the reader. Predicate pushdown does the same, but then for Filters, if you can do a filter before a join, the join will be a lot cheaper. If you can do a filter in the I.O., it's 
all the subsequent operations will be cheaper because you have less rows. Makes sense, right? Join branch reordering. In the streaming engine, we want to reorder some the, the, the execution of branches sometimes because we want the smallest hash table into the state. We want the smallest table as the state of the left-hand side join because that will remain in memory and we want to keep memory low. So we swap the order sometimes. Scan sharing, if we see that a file is needed more times, we, we cache it. Um, this is very similar to common sub plan elimination. We already saw that if we have parts of the join, parts of the, parts of the plans that are reused, we cache it. Same for sub expressions. Sub expressions, this can happen a lot. Um, and type coercion, where we try to match types. Um, cor yeah. Um, other optimizations we do is um, we have a stack optimizer where we have different optimization rules and they are applied recursively. Um, and by recursively applying the optimization onto a fixed point, um, you, can you, have, you can have very simple op operation, optimizations that cannot hit the first time, but once we've done another optimization, the second time the optimization can hit. Um, so, so you can imagine this as a, um, for, for instance, one thing is constant folding. If we have column A plus one plus two, and if you would run it naively, you would have, for, for instance, a million row column, you add one, then you have another materialization, and then you add two, you have another materialization. Um, if you constant fold, if you uh, fold to constants, so one plus two, if you do this immediately, you, um, you can do the plus three at once, and this saves a materialization. Um, but it also makes the expression simpler and, and can hit another branch after that, or another optimization pass. We replace functions. For instance, a sort.head can be replaced in the top K. If we see that you um, add different string columns, so a, string A plus string B plus string C, and those are columns, um, we rewrite it to a concat, for instance, because that will, um, the other one will have exponential uh, behavior. Fused arithmetics, um, we can do A times B plus C in a single allocation. Um, instead of doing A times B allocate plus, plus C allocate, uh, we flatten nested unions, uh, reuse buffers, uh, and there's more stuff. Um, and it will also be added more, especially on the replacing functions. Um, we're looking into um, mathematically defining the polar's arithmetic, the polar's uh, expression language, so we can mathematically prove that we can do certain optimizations. Um, yeah, so we, um, we hope to be to prove that we can replace more stuff later. Um, and the fourth promise is that you get performance. And performance is um, performance like you get in NumPy, for instance, C-like performance. Uh, Polis is written from scratch in Rust, and we control every performance critical code branch. If we we, and I think this is underestimated how important this is, this is. I think it's super important that you control memory and that you understand where your, uh, where your program is slow and you can adapt that core algorithm. So we go through tremendous efforts to have cache efficient code. We use explicit SIMBD, but also out of vectorization, try to rewrite code in a way that we can get out of vectorization uh, we go out of a way to reuse memory buffers be because heap allocations are very expensive, but also um, it doubles memory every time you need a new buffer. For that buffer, you double memory. And as I said, in the first point, we try to parallelize very effectively. Um, a misconception, I read this a lot on the internet. Um, Polars is not based on Pyro. We don't dispatch to Pyro. Th those are different implementations, and um, um, it's just th th they're different implementations, and you cannot say that one will equal the other afterwards. They, they will have different performance characteristics. Uh, one will be faster in this, the other will be faster in that, but 
they're not equal. So um, I want to get that, that misconception out of the world because I put a lot of time in implementing our algorithm, so it feels a bit, <laughs> yeah, it's not nice if someone says, discredits your work, that it's done by someone else. Um, almost all compute is implemented in Polars by us. Um, we use the Arrow 2 implementation for our Arrow format. There's another misconception about what Arrow is, and there, I understand this, it's very hard to, to, to understand the differences, but Arrow, in my opinion, is two things. We have a memory format, which says how we specify memory and how Arrow arrays should be defined. And there are different implementations of Arrow. There's Pi Arrow, C Arrow, or C++ Arrow, which is Pi Arrow. There is the Rust native implementation, Apache Arrow RS, and there's Arrow 2. And they're all implementations of Arrow, which um, have different things. But the, it, it most of all is an agreement in how we specify memory. Um, other than that, a lot of Arrow implementations also implement compute. And compute can be kernels of operations on this arrow specification buffers. Um, yeah, but, but don't, com don't conflate those two. Uh, for Polars, almost all compute is implemented in Polars. So you can also not say that Polars has arrow to compute uh, performance. That also doesn't make much sense. Um, about the performance, yeah, Polars is very fast, and I, it's one of the it's among the fastest factorized query engines that are out there open source. It's not really <laughs> easy to read, but from left to right, uh, left in purple is Polars, um, then we have DocDB, then in blue we have Pandas, um, then we have Dask in sort of red, green is Spark, and last is Vex with the Parquet source. Um, and not all engines were able to finish the um, the, the, the query. Spark should be able to finish. There were just some errors which I didn't have time to fix because I don't like the Java errors. And, um, so Spark can finish all those queries, but um, yeah, we didn't. So the, 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 uh, don't, uh, that, that's not, f the, uh, take the Spark one with a grain of salt in the, where it's missing. Um, Vex missed, um, joins on uh, multiple columns, so we couldn't do all the queries. So this is the TPCH, the, uh, TPCH benchmark, which is a very common benchmark for, for uh, databases. The queries are very database-like. So there are, for instance, uh, a lot of queries with five joins, um, and query engines that are built for databases will have, a, have more uh, benefit there because they also do join order optimization, which Polis doesn't, so we will be slower there at that point. This is something we want to add in the future. Um, but yeah, as you can see, we're super fast. Um, yeah, don't know what to say about it uh, else. Um, here's another, this is the database benchmark. This was initially run by H2O AI. Uh, later, Dr. B took it over. Um, it runs a bit of an old version of Polars, which didn't get a lot of materialization uh, improvements. Um, so DuckDB had the home advantage because they can, could run their DuckDB latest with an asterisk, which wasn't released yet. Um, but yeah, still um, in the same order of magnitude and um, very fast. Um, that's the, just the, the, the um, the promise, if you use our API as you should, you get a lot of performance. And fifth, the promise is there that if you use learn our API, you get knowledge extrapolation. Because if you learn the expressions, it's like learning a vocabulary of a language. If you learn, for instance, if you take the syntax of Python, the vocabulary of Python is not really big. Um, the vocabulary of a programming language is not really big, but with the with that small vocabulary, you can build any program you want. You can do anything with it. And um, we want to give the same composability on an expression level. Um, you get, we give you a lot of expression by composing them. You can solve a lot of problems. And you can use it in many contexts. I didn't explain it, but a context takes a group of expressions and run that, runs them in parallel for you. Um, 
Yeah. And that's the, the yeah, also sort of the end. Um, a too long didn't listen. The promise is if you use Polars idiomatically, we will promise you that uh, we can make your code fast, easier to read, and strict. And we have a, this will reduce debugging time. Um, we hope to save you a lot of um, sh sh uh, gun, uh, food guns. Um, what's the time? We've got 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. Um, we're very really active on Discord. There's a lot of community help there. So if you can, if you're interested, join the Discord. And yeah, you get a lot of um, information there, but just scrolling a bit and uh, learning how, how stuff can be done and, and how Polaris does things. Um, so come around. I just want to, I've got a few minutes. We can go to the talks, but I also want to show how, the, uh, how good we are at um, utilizing all, all threads. Um, yeah, it's, it's mostly about HTOP. It's just a satisfying. Uh... So, is this visible? I like this. Do you see the threads? All green. This is in a, this is, these are mostly group by algorithms. The group by is not embarrassingly parallel, but we are able, almost on, on most Polish queries, you will see all your threads green. And um, this is not green with, with serialization, deserialization. This is green with effective work. So, um, yeah, I wanted to finish with that. Thank you. <laughs> We have time for questions. Just raise your hand and wait for the mic, please. Thank you very, thank you very much. Great talk. Um, at what point do you think should one switch to a database? Actually, so. Uh, Basically, where do you stop? Do you keep statistics of uh, the data frames over different queries, or at what point, basically, is it an in-memory database? Um, we keep we don't keep statistics on the data frames because it doesn't work. And so you have you have transactional engines and OLAP engines. Um, the difference is that transactional engines like uh, Postgres is built keep statistics and has an index and can make the queries faster. In OLAP, this often isn't the case, because after the first group by, after the first join, your indexes are, don't exist anymore, and you need to uh, do it. So most OLAP engines don't, wor don't work with indices. Um, there is still effort to be made. You can hive partitioning, um, parquet file statistics. Th these are. Hive partitioning we don't do yet, but we want to keep statistics of this, and we also want to add some, especially for the cloud, we want to keep statistics locally because going to the cloud and getting the statistics there and then going back and then this interaction between starting your query, this will have a high latency, which we don't want. Um, but Polars wants to be an OLAP query engine with a data frame front end. So it wants to be the same as an OLAP query engine as a database is. But we don't want to do transactions. So yeah, that's, uh, I hope that that answers the question. Thank you. Yep. More questions? Hi, uh, what's the next plan of Polars since you received a lot of money now and congratulations, uh, by the way? <laughs> and what yeah. do you do now in the, in the future? Yeah, two things. Um, now there's finally time to uh, 
get some paid work on the open source polars, which wasn't, it was only me. Um, so we can increment that development time, which is great. And we want to make open source polars better. Um, and I, we want to have the distinction, open source polars will do everything from a single machine. Um, so everything polars is now, but then better and more and more expressions, more out of course streaming, more more polars, polars as you see it now, but extrapolated. And for the product, we want to be on the cloud side, um, being able to read and write to S3, um, run it in AWS. Um, so that's, that's something we want to do with the company, um, but that's on the product side, yeah. Thank you for the talk. Um, I'm very in curious about the group by operations that you have, and if you can kind of dump their state. Dump so, their state? Yes, yeah, save the state of the group by operation before it finished, uh, so you can maybe pick it up later when you have more data. Does it make sense, or should I try to rephrase? You want to dump the state? Mm -hmm. So, for example, you have a few uh, chunks of data, and what you want to do is to have max uh, value from everything. Uh, but the last chunk isn't maybe ready yet. Right? So maybe some, some, someone creating this data right now. Mm -hmm. Technically speaking, it still allows you to calculate max over the first three chunks, and then get the last one and get the result immediately when the uh, result is ready. Yeah. I think that would be more of a streaming algorithm as um, at least you want to keep because we have an internal state and that, <clears throat> that in yeah, I'm sorry I was asking about this internal state basically somehow yeah. it's saved yeah but this internal state um, can be rather complex but it also depends on the so we have a lot of false spots and we make decisions in time to which which false spot we go so there's no unified internal state of a group by. Um, but I think if I would solve this as a Polish users, I would, I would partition the data first and partition the data, keep partitions on, on, the, on the Polar side. And if there, there comes in new, new data, you can store it in that partition and do the group by there, which would still reuse something, but not everything, because you only need to reuse the partition uh, part. What you could do, um, another thing is keep data sorted. And you can merge sorted in Polars and Polars. If you have sorted data, Polars will be way faster here because a sorted column is sort of an index. We know we can do binary search and we know that if we hit this group that everything after this will be from the same group until we fit an, find, an, find another thing. So you can, you could use some information of how Polars works to do that, but not in, we can, you cannot save the state, no. Thank you. Hi. Hi. What do you think about uh, running something like Polars or data frame libraries? Uh, on GPUs? Yeah, I think it's great. Um, if you have data on the GPU, if you need to swap between GPU and CPU, I, I'm not an expert, but I could, I think just moving data around between memory uh, can be very expensive. Um, Polars will be slower than QDF, depending on the GPU. But it, it is in the same order of magnitude in benchmarks I've seen. Um, but for Polars, we get this question sometimes. <laughs> do, do you, will it run on the GPU? And I don't know if people realize the amount of effort that's hidden in that question. <laughs> the, it's a complete refocus. And I don't say it will never happen. I mean, QDF is also a Pandas API, I believe, mostly on the GPU. So maybe if we become very successful, uh, somebody will do this. And uh, yeah, power to them then. Um, yeah. 
Okay, I think we have time for one more question there. I think we're running out of time. Uh, thank you. I had one question. Um, in, uh, in the Polar's docs, you specifically say that you, you don't use indexes, uh, while Pandas heavily relies on indexes. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak a bit more to that decision, uh, and, and, and like both in terms of the implementation and a bit like in terms of data modeling, because in Pandas maybe you tend to use an index as a kind of unique label of a, of a piece of data, and how you translate that into Polar's. Um, yeah, <clears throat> so I first want to disambiguate indexes. So we have the index as Pandas uses them, the multi-index and the index as a sort of a uh, ut utilitary column, can I call it that? Um, and we have indexes in the database way, which are sort of a hidden state that show that, that I'm not saying Polis will not use the latter. Um, we will because I was just not a fan. This is more subjective. I was not a fan of the implicitness of indexes. I, a reset index changes the way the operation works. And if I read code and I read a reset index, I always need to mentally, I don't know where, where we were and where we go now um, and how this operate. And it can be just my lack of knowledge on, on indexes, but I, I felt there, there is an implicit state there. And I wanted this to be explicit. And also, I just want you to write a join if you mean join on that. Um, so, so I want things to be more explicit so I can read it more. Um, and you, there are multiple ways to, there's functional programming, there's object-oriented programming, programming. There's, you don't need an index to get a certain, from A to B, there are different ways to do things. So in Polar's, when I designed it, I was looking at it, I thought, I don't think we need it. We can do without it, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're on time for breakfast, for the break. Any other question, feel free to ask Richie privately. Yeah, thanks, Richie, again. Thank you.